second one. <laughs> I am really excited to be up here talking to you today about browser extensions. We're gonna talk about what they can do, some of the challenges my team faced when we built ours, and most importantly, what all this has to do with sandwiches. But first, let me introduce myself. My name is Shannon Capper, and I'm a front-end developer here in Seattle at a startup called Textio. So to explain how I got wrapped up in the wonderful world that is browser extensions, I should tell you a little bit about what I do. So this is Textio. We're an augmented writing platform that lets you know how your language is gonna perform as you're writing it. We give your document a score, we use highlights to draw your attention to key phrases, and we suggest replacements for troublesome language. Now, notice here that we're writing a recruiting mail. But as you can imagine, this isn't really the ideal user experience for writing email. It's pretty disruptive to have to come over to our website to write your email, and then copy and paste it into your actual mail client to send it. Ideally, we'd want to bring our augmented writing experience to you in the places that you would normally write. And that's why we decided to build a browser extension. So basically, we wanted to build something that looked like this. This is someone else's page and someone else's email editor, but with all of the Textio UI that our users know and love. So this was the challenge before us, and all of it was theoretically possible using a browser extension. But what actually is a browser extension? Out of curiosity, by show of hands, how many of you use browser extensions on a regular basis? Basically everyone. <laughs> okay, now how many of you know how to actually build one? That's actually a pretty good number. So, I mean, you may be smarter than me, but like I use browser extensions all the time and I had no idea how they worked until I actually started building one. And it turns out they're pretty straightforward. A browser extension or plugin is just a small piece of software that runs inside the web browser. Modern extensions are built with HTML, JavaScript, and CSS. So if you're already used to doing web development, this should be right in your wheelhouse. And there's even a standardized web extension API that's backed by W3C. And that API is supported by Chrome, Firefox, Opera, and Edge. And notice how I don't say Internet Explorer or Safari. They do support extensions, but their setup is completely different, so you won't be able to easily share your code between them and the others. So at this point, you might be asking yourself, well, what can a browser extension do? And you know what? That is the wrong question. The question you should be asking is what can't a browser extension do? Because these things are crazy powerful. And frankly, it is kind of terrifying knowing all the things they're capable of. For example, an extension can yield lots of control over your tabs. It can open new ones, it can read which ones are open currently, and it can close them if it wants to. So pop-up blockers are a good example of this. They monitor your open tabs and they detect, uh, and they close any that they detect to be pop-ups. We can also make network requests and add an icon to the browser's toolbar. So for example, a mail checker will regularly ping a server to see if you have any new mail, and if it detects that you have new ones, it shows you how many you've got. We can also read, modify, and add to the DOM of any web page, and this can be used in a whole bunch of really creative ways. This is a video of Google Translate's extension, which can detect when you make a selection, reads a selected text from the DOM, and adds a tooltip to the page to show you what the translation is. Super cool. Another example of a plugin manipulating the DOM is my personal favorite. It's called Millennials to Snake People, and it is awesome. <laughs> what it does is it finds any instance of the word millennials on the page and replaces it with the word snake people. Two great results like this. <laughs> so here, the plugin is actively modifying text nodes put into the DOM by the host page, and that can be really dangerous, but we'll get to that later. So to go back to our earlier question, if browser extensions can do all these amazing and powerful things, then what can't they do? And the list is pretty small. First, they're tied to the browser. So if the browser isn't open, the extension can't run. Pretty obvious, but worth calling out. Next, you can't just go changing your permissions willy-nilly. You have to declare which pages you want to run on and which parts of the web extension API you want to access. That way, when a user downloads your extension, they kind of know what they're getting themselves into, and if you want to go change those permissions later on, the extension gets temporarily disabled until the user agrees to the new ones. So, I mean, hopefully you're all honest people who like, don't want to go sneaking behind your users' backs, but well, even if you did, the, the browser wouldn't let you. Uh, so, probably the most important thing that an extension can't do is it can't directly interact with the host page's JavaScript. 
When an extension is running on a page, it's in its own isolated environment. It can't see what the host page's JavaScript is doing, and the host page can't see what the extension is doing. They actually don't even share the same window object, and while this is sometimes a problem, for the most part, it's a good thing. At Cascadia JS two years ago, one of the speakers, Noah Adams, talked about the challenges of writing third-party JavaScript, and one of the things he called out was dealing with a polluted window object. The host page might do some bad monkey patching, or they can define node module code uh, on the window in a way that would interact badly with your code. And the good news is that we don't have to deal with any of that because we're in an isolated environment. <laughs> so under the hood, a browser extension is made up of four parts. There's a manifest file, which contains some metadata and specifies those permissions that we were talking about. There's a pop-up, which can be invoked by clicking on the extension's icon in the browser's toolbar. It's like a little self-contained web page that the extension owns. There's a background script, which runs headlessly behind the scenes whenever the uh, browser is open, and it isn't tied to any one tab, and it has access to the full web extension API. And then there are the content scripts, and these run within the context of a specific tab, and they can talk back and forth the ba with the background script. If you're used to seeing server client architecture diagrams, you'll notice that this looks pretty similar. So these content scripts are the ones that can interact with the DOM, and they're what we're gonna focus on for the rest of our talk. But let's get back to our story. My team decided that we wanted to build a Chrome extension to make it easier to use Textio while writing email. We decided to start with just Chrome because that's what most of our users use, and we knew we could easily extend out to other browsers if we wanted to in the future. So short term, we wanted to bring Textio to recruiting mail and supported uh, email clients, namely LinkedIn Recruiter and Gmail. But long term, we wanted to build something that we could extend as Textio grows to bring Textio everywhere that you could write on the web. So now that we know all the powerful things an extension can do, it should be pretty straightforward to make this picture a reality, right? No, no, it was not straightforward at all. It turns out writing JavaScript that runs on someone else's page is way harder than writing JavaScript that runs on your page. As a browser extension, you have no control over the page. You can't control how it's laid out, you can't control what its code does, and you can't control how it handles user actions. And every single page is different. Not only that, but it's also super easy to abuse your power and change things in a way that breaks the host site. So to protect ourselves from the chaos of unmaintainable code and never-ending hotfixes, we laid down a set of principles. Principle number one, is don't write site-specific conditionals. And principle number two is don't break the host page. So let's start with the first one. One of the biggest problems with writing an extension that works across multiple hosts is that each one's different. What if you need to tweak your UI a little bit based on the layout of different sites? What if you need the selectors that grab native elements to be different on different pages? In the early days of your extension, especially if you're starting out with a small subset of supported sites like we were, it can be really tempting to let site-specific conditionals creep into your code base. If I'm on Gmail, do A, and if I'm on LinkedIn, do B. But this is the path to madness, because not only does putting if else is everywhere in your code make it really hard to read, but it's also gonna be an absolute nightmare to maintain. Now, every time you wanna support a new site, you have to track down every place scattered throughout your code base where you have site-specific logic, and that will be no fun at all. So wherever you possibly can, you might try building your solutions in a generic way so they work on every host page. The key, the key thing here is code reuse. The more of your code that's reusable across all sites, the better. And where that isn't possible, one option you can try is to limit your site-specific code to a single configuration object, one config per site that has a defined API. All the rest of your code can then just generically consume this site config without worrying about which host site they're on. And that way, if you want to add support for a new site, all you have to do is fill in a single new site config and you'll be good to go. So let's see this in action, shall we? I'm gonna exit out of here and let's mirror our screen. Okay, so here we are in Gmail. I don't know about you guys, but there's just something I really miss about writing on my computer Something that just feels missing. You know what I miss? I miss Clippy. 
I want to build an extension that brings Clippy back when I'm writing my email. So here we have a content script that's running in Gmail. Let's see if we can get him into Yahoo, too, which apparently has no internet connection. Great. Uh, so let's look at some code. So here we are in uh, our text editor, or our code editor, and this is the content script that's running on Gmail. And it's really simple. It just has three parts. First, we're going to get our site config. Next, we're going to pull for mail windows. And then if we find a new mail window, we're going to append the Clippy. So let's break each of these down. Here, so right now we only support Gmail, so we only have one site config. And this is really simple. It just has a single item in it, which is our mail window selector. And we want this in our site config because this selector is going to be different on every site. And this gives us the chance to uh, do the right selector on a per site basis. So here in our get site config, it's really simple. All we're going to do is we're going to get the domain name off of the URL. If it's one of our supported domains, we are going to return the equivalent config. Next, in pull for mail windows, we have a set interval here, really simple. We're going to consume that site config and pull the selector off to uh, pull the DOM to see if we have any new mail windows. If we have a new one, we're going to mark it as found, and then we're going to append Clippy. And then here in append Clippy, we are going to create an image element. We're going to specify the source as our GIF. We're going to add a little bit of styling, give him a size, and then append him to the mail window. So I think that we're going to be able to get him working in Yahoo without too many changes. And let's see if we can get that happening. So here, let's add Yahoo as a supported domain. It's going to be mail.yahoo.com. And then we are going to return a Yahoo config. And then let's define that. So here, we are going to mirror our config from Gmail. And then I cheated and looked up what the selector is. So it's going to be editor container. So that was it. Let's see if this worked. So I'm going to refresh our extension, refresh the page. I don't have any internet. That's unfortunate. Let's connect and try that again. And there we go. We've got Clippy. <laughs> But we kind of have a problem. He's like a little small. Like in Gmail, the mail window's smaller, so he seems like a good size. But here he kind of gets drowned out. So let's see if we can use our site config to fix that. So let's add some site-specific styling. So down here in append Clippy, instead of using this hard-coded value, let's consume our site config and define a Clippy size value there. So up here in Gmail, let's do Clippy size is 85 pixels. And over in Yahoo, let's make him 120. So now, if everything worked according to plan, he should be a little bit bigger. Beautiful. But I think we can do one better. So remember principle number one. If we can avoid site-specific code, we should. Because that way, we can keep our site configs as small as possible and make it super easy to add new sites in the future. And really, I think all we want is for Clippy to kind of be a certain percentage of the mail window's height. So let's do that. Let's come back to our code editor. Let's remove this value off of the site config. And then down here in append Clippy, let's use our uh, mail window's height dynamically to decide how big Clippy should be. So I'm going to get the mail window's height really quick. I'm going to use get computed style and pull the height property off of there. And then that is going to be a string. So let's parse it into a float. And then let's make Clippy, let's make him 3 tenths the height of the mail window. So if everything went according to plan, he should be exactly the same size he was before. Great. But now we're doing it in a dynamic way that's going to work on any host site. Awesome. All right, let's go back to some slides. So now we've talked about how we might fulfill principle number one. Let's talk about principle number two. Don't break the host page. So this one seems obvious, but it's actually a little tricky to follow if you're doing anything involving adding UI to the page. Perhaps a more specific way of wording it is avoid modifying the host page's markup. 
So remember before how we talked about our extension living in its own isolated world? It, we can't see the host page's JavaScript and they can't see us. But the one thing that is shared is the DOM. And if we go making changes to the DOM, especially mutating or deleting stuff that's already there, the host page won't be expecting it because they don't even know that we exist. Let's use a simple example. So here's part of a DOM tree rendered by a page. It's just a paragraph with a little bit of text. Now let's say that we as an extension want to highlight the word hello. The naive thing we could try would be to delete the text node that's in the paragraph and insert two new ones. We want a highlight span containing the word hello and then a new text node containing the word world. But we have a problem. So it turns out that this page was rendered using React and frameworks like React really don't like it when you go mucking with the DOM behind their backs. It's keeping a virtual representation of the DOM in memory and it still thinks that that text node is there. So let's say that React goes through another render pass and it wants to change the paragraph to say, hello, Seattle. Best case scenario is that React blows away the whole paragraph element and then replaces it with a new one. And that's kind of a bummer for us because now our highlight's gone. But worst case scenario is that React just tries to replace that one text node, which is no longer there, and it blows up with a not found error. So now we've broken the page and thrown principle number two out the window. So this seems bad. Highlighting text is kind of a core experience of our product at Textio. And if our Chrome extension can't add inline spans around the host markup, then what are we supposed to do? Well, we did like many engineers before us have done, and we drew on whiteboards, a lot. And eventually, we came up with a different highlighting solution entirely. And that's how the sandwich was born. And despite it having the stupidest code name ever, it is the crowning achievement of our Chrome extension. So we call our highlighter the sandwich because it's made up of lots of layers. And these layers, which are all absolutely positioned one on top of the other, give us fine-grained control over how we render highlights on the page. And they do so in a way that doesn't touch the native editor. So, Let's say that the text in the native editor looks like this. But because this is a rich text editor, users could do things like change the text color, or add some background color, or maybe change some font sizes. And now let's say that we as the extension want to add some highlights to the page like this. A green highlight around our team and orange highlight around connect with you. So for added fun, when you hover over a highlight, we also want to turn the text white. So in the sandwich, the topmost layer is our native editor. So we want it on top so that it picks up all the user's mouse and keyboard events just like normal, and we're not gonna touch its markup at all. The only thing we're gonna do to it is we're gonna make it transparent except for the cursor. That way, the user will only see the layers that we render underneath. Directly behind the native editor is our text copy. This is an exact duplicate of the native editor just with all the background colors hidden. So when you're typing in an editor that has our sandwich mounted on it, this is actually the text you're gonna see. And because we own this copy, it's safe for us to modify its markup to turn hovered text white. Below that is our highlight layer. Here we have a, bu a bunch of colored divs that are all sized and positioned exactly so that they sit behind the text that they're supposed to be highlighting. By getting the bounding recs of the phrases that we want to highlight, we can calculate exactly we where we want to position these in the DOM. And last but not least, we have our background color copy. This is the same as the text copy, just with all the text colors hidden and the background colors visible. And this allows us to draw our highlights on top of any background colors that's in the markup so they don't get obscured. Put it all together, and you get this. Beautifully highlighted text in someone else's rich text editor. With this technique, we really don't have to touch the native editor's markup at all, so we're much less likely to break the page. But like with most things, our sandwich highlight highlighter came at a price. It solved a lot of our problems, but it also made a bunch of new ones. For example, when I say that we made exact duplicates of the native editor, that turned out to be way harder than we thought it would be. Uh, making a copy of a DOM node's contents is easy, but making the copy look exactly the same is not. We ended up using a combination of get computed style and some specific style overrides to get them to look right, but oh man did we hit a lot of bugs. We'd get like one pixel differences that throw off the whole layout and cause all our highlights to get drawn in the wrong spots. 
And we eventually got it sorted out, but oh, it was not super fun. Next, we also had a problem picking up mouse events properly. So remember that we need our native editor to be the top layer so that the user can type into it and make selections. But when we do that, the mouse events don't propagate down to the other layers. And we want those events so that when you hover over a highlighted phrase, we can change its styling and uh, open a tooltip. So to work around that, we ended up implementing our own mouse tracking. We put a mouse move listener on the topmost element so that we could track the cursor position. And then from there, we can calculate if, if the mouse is within the bounds of any of our highlights. Then if the mouse moves into a highlight, we can pipe simulated mouse events down to the lower layers as if it had happened natively. And this felt like a total hack, but we could not find a better way of getting the mouse events to hit both layers at once. So we also hit some snags getting the, our sandwich layers to be super positioned one on top of the other. This is a natural use case for absolute positioning, but in order for that to work, we need a parent node that's positioned as well. And remember principle number two, we don't want to break post page. And if we go slap a position relative onto a native parent node, we risk messing up the host page's layout. So to solve this problem, we pulled in a technology called the Shadow DOM. So the Shadow DOM got us a bunch of different benefits, and talking about how it works could easily fill up another speaking slot here. So I'll just be very brief about why it helped us. Let's say that this is a piece of the DOM that we got from our host page, and we're going to call this the Light DOM as opposed to Shadow DOM. Yeah. Uh, so in our Light DOM, we have a, uh, a parent node, and it has a child node, which is our native editor. So the Shadow DOM API lets us take our parent node which we're now going to call the shadow host, and we're going to attach a subtree that's going to be hidden from the main application. Within that subtree, we can render a div with position relative, and then within that, we can drop in our original child node. This is using a feature of the shadow DOM called the slot API, which lets you insert light DOM contents from the shadow host into the shadow tree. Now, we can add our absolutely positioned sandwich layers as siblings of the native editor. And this is great, because to the application, the DOM tree still looks like that. It still thinks that the uh, native editor is a direct child of the shadow host. But what actually gets rendered to the page is that. So we can absolutely position to our heart's desire. And thus, principle number two is fulfilled. So how did it all work out? Was our Chrome extension a success? I probably wouldn't be here talking to you today if it wasn't. So let me show you. I am going to mirror my screen again. And then let's come over here. So here we are in Gmail again, and now we are writing a recruiting mail. So let's turn on Textio for Chrome. Boom. Beautifully highlighted text in someone else's editor. We've got highlights in both the subject line and the body. We've got a score. We can do things like take suggestions. So here we have an orange phrase, which means that this is causing less people to respond to my recruiting mail. So let's replace that. Oh, now it's a green phrase, which means it's going to attract people. And it, the score updated. We can type in real time, and highlights will update. So if I say, wow, this is great. Not only do highlights show up in the text I just typed, but all the ones that are already there move over. And then, because this is a rich text editor, let's do terrible things like making the font big and adding some text color. And all of it just kind of works. So because we wrote this not as a Gmail highlighter, but as an editor highlighter, it also works in LinkedIn. So here we are recruiting the uh, fantastic host of our event today. Uh, and you'll notice that it's the exact same experience here as it was in Gmail. So we're really happy with this for two reasons. One, we're not touching the native editor's markup, so we're much less likely to break the page. And two, this is totally extensible. We can, use, we can drop this into basically any editor, and it'll work. We're using those site configs that we talked about earlier, and so it's really easy to expand out as Textio grows into other domains. All right, let's wrap this up. OK. So if there's anything I want you guys to get out of this talk today, it's these three things. I mean, obviously, besides sick memes, those definitely gain those. So one, a browser extension is an incredibly powerful tool. Really, the only limit to what you can accomplish with them is your imagination. Two, writing code that runs on someone else's site is an adjustment. It's a mental shift in how you approach problems. There's going to be a whole mess of new challenges you haven't ever had to think about before. 
And three, keep the principles in mind. Avoid host site specific code wherever you can, and don't break someone else's page by meddling with their DOM. Trust me, you will thank yourself later. So that's it for me. I, I really hope that after today, you're all inspired to go building an extension a shot if you haven't done so already. There are some good resources at the link here as well as the slides and demo from today. And if you have any questions, come find me either here or online. I'd tell you you could find me on Twitter, but that would be a lie because I don't have one. So email or GitHub works great. Thank you so much, everybody, and happy building. <laughs>